Messi. Oh, what a goal that is! Hi, I'm Ramon Vega, and you are listening to Bola Bola Show. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Bola Bola Show podcast. I'm Steven and once again, I'm always joined by my two co-host buddies. First and foremost, Bala, how's it going? Steven, thank you for the uh, introduction. Uh, things are going good. I uh, hope same for you, Elwin. Yes, uh, yes, guys, you know, looking forward again to another great episode. So, so guys, today, you know, uh, we have a very special episode because uh, our special guest is also a former international with us. Okay? He represented Switzerland 23 times and played in the Euro 1996. You know, a defensive strong man at the centre-back role. And most fans, in fact, here in Malaysia may remember him during his Tottenham Hotspur days in the late 90s and early 2000s. So here at the Bola Bola Show, we are honoured to bring to you Mr. Ramon Wega. Grazie Ramon and thanks for coming on board. How has it been for you? Hello guys, how is Ivan? Uh, very good. I'm very glad to speak to Malaysia and to you guys. Uh, it's an honor to be honest to you. So um, all well. I hope everything is well with you guys as well and you're healthy. Yep, things here, things here are going great, Ramon. And uh, maybe Ramon, you can just let our listeners know what are the projects that you're currently uh, involved in? Well, there are Obviously, the football industry, as most uh, the people realize in the last eight months, but not just the football industry, I think within in business, you know, the COVID-19 has definitely had a huge impact financially to all the uh, clubs, federations and associations, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so my, my main brain project the last six months is not only that, but it's very really much helping and restructuring a football association, helping them to get the finance in place, including clubs, football clubs in Europe as well. So pretty much I'm acting as a kind of financier in, within the football industry, but most important, uh, the football clubs and association, you know. Uh, so these are the projects are... In principle, now mostly busy, uh, to be honest today. It's uh, very exciting in the same time because I think uh, the football industry has a little bit uh, been giving a wake up call uh, within the last seven months because the financial has put them into in a reality check, we call it in this case, you know. Mm -hmm. and, but I'm happy to assist and help, um, of course, uh, to, to bring a certain and funds into their necessary needed for the development of football, you know. Especially football federations at the moment are, of course, in certain countries around the globe, are really struggling because sometimes the government doesn't really help them. And yes, of course, FIFA, some part might give it, but, you know, again, there are restrictions how much funding you get from that as well. So, uh, so my, my principal uh, kind of... Uh, kind of day-to-day -day is pretty much advising lots of football federation and football clubs at the moment, you know. Okay, excellent. So, you know, uh, Ramon, let's get into your playing career. So, you started your career with Grasshopper Zurich and uh, you had six fabulous years with them, including three Swiss league titles. Mm -hmm. However, you were overlooked by Swiss national coach at that time, Roy Hodgson, uh, to participate in the USA 94 squad, you know. So, did Mr. Ochsen actually explain to you why he did not select you? Oh, yes, so it was a short explanation, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was obviously disappointed at that time. Uh, in the same time, I was also very happy to be a part of such a successful squad at that mm -hmm. time. You know? Let's not forget Switzerland uh, for the 94 World Cup was the first ever World Cup after over 30 years really qualified, you know. Yeah. That's for football an enormous achievement, you know. And I think Roy Oxen, of course, was one of the major players in this. And also he actually re renewed the whole football uh, kind of fans in Switzerland. Because Switzerland are very conservative, a little bit kind of, yeah, football is not the main kind of sports. But with Roy Hodgson, he really put football back uh, to the map and, and make it very attractive as such, you know. And to be part of such a generation and, and qualify for the World Cup, because I was pretty much most of the qualification games 
up to to to, to the World Cup there, you know. Mm-hmm. But also in the same time, so I, I also understood I was the younger kind of let's call it in that case the boy because uh, the, the the older generation were the players who were playing every day. So yeah, I was expected to go because obviously that's what you do as a sportsman. You're always competitive, yeah. but in the same time, humble ways, uh, I was I'm grateful. I was part of such a good squad and had experience to do it. So, mm. but uh, you know, I got uh, enumerated, of course, uh, for the next tournament, the '96, and that's what uh, I think uh, was most most important tournament for myself personally as a career. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, Ramon, do do you still uh, keep in touch with Mr. Watson these days? Uh, yeah, sometimes. Uh, yeah, of course, mm. he's based in London as well. Obviously, he's now yep. with Chris Palace mm-hmm. involved, yep. you know, and uh, he's done a very good job. I think, it, from my point of view, he's uh, without a doubt a great gentleman as a as a, as a coach, a manager, and, and as a human being as well. You know, uh, yep. within football, that's kind of sometimes very rare that you have that all three combinations. You know. And and he really, 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 uh, be honest, you uh, has a n- lots of knowledge for the in- from the industry as a coach, and he's done a great, great job for Switzerland without a doubt. He was one of the best uh, manager we had, uh, and even today, as a, as as a, yeah, as a legend, we call it in terms of a football point of view, you know. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Of course, with your talent, you did make it into the Swiss squad for the Euro 1996. And uh, how is it your feeling when you featured in your first match and I even scored a goal against the host England in a one-one draw? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I can't really say too much and celebrate the goal against England because I live in England. <laughs> 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 so uh, I need to be very careful with that, you know. Now, but I think it's been a long time ago, and and at that time also I was playing for Tottenham Hotspurs already, you know. When when I scored against England, uh, so and especially uh, the defender was actually marking me it was an Arsenal uh, defender. So it was a good derby on the pitch, but actually playing Switzerland England at that time. And it, it, listen, if you score for your club, it's a great uh, and fantastic experience because you you play week in week out. But if you actually score for your national team, It's a completely different feeling because you you're not playing week in week out. You maybe every couple of months you get together and you're playing against the best teams in the world. And in this case, you know, like England, and you on top of that you actually score against England. It's a fantastic achievement and experience as a player. And I was really over the moon as well, you know. So coming as a small country, Switzerland, you know, for us. <laughs> Every little step is a big step, you know. Uh, so humble wise, I would say yes. I, I, I felt fantastic to be honest with you, scoring against England. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, your your first venture abroad was signing for Serie A side Cagliari, but you only actually spent seven months with them. I mean, what what happened during your time in Italy? It didn't happen a lot. I think I played too well. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> in, in these seven months, because uh, first of all, I think. I need to come back one step before I signed for Calgary. The Euro '96 was pretty much my biggest platform as an international player because when you play such big tournaments, that's where the players are being displayed as such, you know. And the whole football world is watching you. All the coaches in the world are watching you and see if you're capable to play in different uh, uh, leagues as such, you know. And our uh, at that time. Switzerland played a fantastic tournament and most of the football managers in Europe, the top managers uh, at the time, was really looking into potentially playing for their team, you know. And let's not be honest, you know, the 90s of Serie A was one of the best leagues in the world. There were the best players playing in that league, you know. And if you have an offer to play as a defender, and on top of that, coming from a small country like Switzerland, to play there... It's an honor, and actually, from my point of view, it was a fantastic experience. But at the same time, I was playing great in that six, seven months. Already, English team were behind me and wanted me prior to actually signing with Calgary, including Italian teams. You know, so like the Liverpools, the Leeds, and Tottenham Hotspurs. These are the three teams at the time were really. Follow me even in Serie A, and really wanted to meet before I actually entered the, uh, the league in Serie A. So what happened? I then agreed with Tottenham Hotspurs at that time, 
uh, to leave in the, in the winter time transfer and, and join Spurs. Mm-hmm. And it was a great experience, Cagliari, in Serie A, I have to be honest. You know, you don't, you don't, I don't think, if I look back now, uh, the Serie A in the 90s, in, uh, from my point of view, I think it was one of the best leagues in the world. And I think one of the best football in the world being played at the time. Because if I think back to defend, as a defender, I played against the Brazilian Ronaldo, the Batistuta, uh, Pepe Signore, uh, Bacho, uh, Savicevic, Boban, uh, you name it. It's like every weekend you have one of the best strikers to play against. And that's not anymore the case today, unfortunately, especially not in the Serie A. Uh, and so I was very grateful to actually play and experience uh, these six, seven months there. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, uh, once you left Italy, you came to England to play for Spurs, which I think most uh, football fans in this part of the world, especially in Southeast Asia, will remember you the most of your three and a half years in Spurs, including a reunion with Christian Gross, who was your yeah. coach in Zurich, right? Uh, yes. What, what, what is it like your time in Spurs? How, I mean, how would you look back during those three and a half years? Um, I think uh, I had a fantastic time, to be honest with you. Actually, nearly four, I have to correct you. Uh, four <laughs> years, you know. So, um, I had a fantastic time, you know. Listen, first of all, uh, I came from Serie A, playing against the best strikers in the world. Come to Tottenham Hotspurs, a big club in England, you know. And, and I had uh, good times and bad times, I have to be honest as well, because I think we went also to a very, very, very bad times as well. We're nearly close to relegation, you know. And that was a little bit... Also for the supporters, a very kind of bad times as well, you know, and for us as a players, for certain, because we really we were struggling to 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 to, to get some results and, and and actually battle against a, a, a and a regular relegation, relegation, you know. But the beauty about such a, a face we had f- the following year, we won the League Cup, the '99 League Cup for Tottenham Hotspurs, you know, and I think. Uh, that's one of, my, one of the biggest highlights, of, in my point of view, uh, playing for Tottenham Hotspurs at the time. You know, it's a great day out. Uh, we're still talking about the old Wembley Stadium. You know, uh, if you ever you guys been there, I don't know, maybe only by TV. But I'm just giving you kind of a flavour, what kind of experience you can actually get just coming out at that big tunnel. You have to walk about 20 yards or more. Very big, long walk, a tunnel. And then suddenly 80,000 people really cheering you. It's, uh, it's a great experience as a player, but also as a, as a, a fan to watch it. And also want, winning the, uh, the, the League Cup for the fans, because the fans didn't have any trophy for nearly over 10 years or so. Okay. So for them, it was a great day out as well. And for me, it was a, a memory laying back. And, and you know, look, you're only talking about it. It's a, it's a fantastic experience I had. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. okay. Despite all the success or the, the experience you had with Tottenham, uh, you were then uh, loaned for six months at Glasgow Celtic, another yes. British, British Cup, uh, club, which mm-hmm. basically you won the Scottish treble with them. And uh, mm-hmm. despite that, apparently you rejected an offer to stay with them. Mm-hmm. Any explanation for that, or is there any 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 reason for that? Yeah, yeah, I can explain you quite clearly and straight to the point, you know. Well, first of all, you know, when Celtic approached me when I was at Spurs, my, my contract was really running out, you know. That's why the six months, I think we need to correct it. I don't think there was a loan because my, my contract was running out okay. in that seven months, you know. So it's not really a loan, you know. It could, you know, you're just finishing the contract over there, you know. Now, coming to Celtic, it was... Again, from my point of view, one of the best time within football I had, Celtic Glasgow, was uh, without a doubt. Because, you know, within six months, it was a, such a big impact, not just for me personally winning the three trophies, because we won the treble for them, but also the, the, the relationship with the supporters, with the club. It's like pretty much I was there already for two, three years. I felt, you know, and I only was six months there, you know, the impact was so, so big, you know, in mm-hmm. me personally. And um, of course, our early stage already wanted to stay a Celtic, okay. But the club and I, the manager, in this case, Martin O'Neill, in those days, 
was not really never really give me an offer to extend or to stay for longer, of course, you know. So you're waiting to have that offer as much as you can. But when you, when you are as a player, your contract is running out, you start to have to look for the future as well. If the club doesn't really want to sign off, you have to move on, you know, as well. So to be honest with you, it's not because I didn't want to extend. I really loved it. I actually wanted to finish my career there, you know, because I think I was at about 31 years old to the time. So for me, I wanted to have another three years uh, at least, you know, or not or even get any offer on the table. So and when you're on that, uh, that level of age, you need to make sure your future is also kind of uh, safe and you, can, and, and you can have some earnings, you know. If you don't have that on the table, then you have to move on, you know. And unfortunately, uh, with Celtic, it didn't happen. But you know what? These seven months with Celtic is for me like being there for three, four years and winning the treble. Um, with them, it's I still, you know, if I look around in my house now, I still see the two trophies in, in my uh, trophy cabinets, you know. So, uh, from that point of view, I have fantastic experience. Celtic is for me one of the best uh, memories I had uh, in football. Mm-hmm. And of course, your last club in England was uh, Watford, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And I remember back then, I think it was around 2002 or three. I mean, it wasn't really a happy ending during your time there. I mean, would you like to shed some light on this? Yes, of course, of course. You know, listen, it's always like that, you know, you're coming from a huge, huge hype of success from Celtic Glasgow, you know. Um, you're going six, seven months, you play extremely well with them. You're winning the trophies. You were talking, we're winning the treble, you know. Celtic didn't want the treble for nearly... 10 years, you know, so actually we, we had uh, that nine year cycle from Rangers, we cut that, you know, uh, I think this year, I think Celtic Glasgow is going to do it potentially for the 10th time, so Rangers has to potentially maybe finish that off, but I think hopefully Celtic is going to do that 10 times winning this, uh, the league, you know, mm-hmm. so it was exactly the same scenario when I was there, we actually uh, finished off uh, that nine year c- cycle from Rangers, you know, and winning all the three trophies in one year, that was like uh, un- unheard at the time. Uh, it was also for me like, wow, this is fantastic, you know. Uh, and then going to Watford, because that was the option at the time uh, I had to sign off. And they were giving me four years contract, you know. If you're 31 years old and you say, okay, that's pretty much my last contract and you're going to retire most like at 35. You ha- you, you're going to take these four years. That gives you security, firstly, financially, of course, you know. Uh, and that was one of the first priorities as well. And, of course, going back to London was not the major uh, issue here because of the security was more important. Because I say, I wanted to stay at Glasgow. I was enjoying Glasgow. And I wanted to stay at Celtic. But uh, I want to have financial security. And what for was giving there for four years. At the beginning, I believed it was a great project because they wanted to, um, to go up to the Premier League. Um, Gianluca Viali was the uh, manager at the time. So the idea and the concept of, of Watford was uh, appealing this well as well, to me as well at that time as a player, to achieve, again, success, you know, uh, uh, with another club. You know, I go up to the Premier League and then, of course, playing the Premier League is possible, etc. But that didn't happen, unfortunately. Um, uh, the season didn't start well. I think uh, underestimated a little bit the whole championship um, um, uh, league as such in, in, in the England, because it's a hard one as well in that side, you know. Uh, and then also the team was not a, a team, it was a lot of individual kind of pl- uh, players together, you know. So um, that was one of the major problems there. And then uh, we realized uh, that uh, we might have to uh, go away from Watford. But at the same time, Watford it was getting some financial crisis. And we were one of the, uh, the players who most earned at that time, you know. So I needed to make a decision with Watford and say, uh, yeah, either Watford goes nearly bankrupt because they have to pay me out the four years or I do a deal with them. They pay me out today for much less of the contract so they don't have to pay me the four years contract completely. 
only uh, not even a uh, 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 20 30 percent of the contract you know so i helped Watford to pretty much keep alive and um, and just uh, move on with life you know okay so uh, ramon you know in 2009 you were involved in an attempt to purchase portsmouth you know but yes. was unsuccessful so can you let us know what happened then and uh, are there any plans on the horizon to own a football club <laughs> It's a good question. Uh, well, first of all, at that time, in 2009, uh, you know, I was already in the financial industry because after playing football career, I went into the private equity sector and asset management. Well, I've been now close to nearly 20 years within that industry, okay, London. Um, but the football industry has always uh, brought me back uh, Enormously, the last 10, 15 years, I was really financing either some TV rights or sponsorship or, or some stadium rights as well, etc. So the whole kind of menu of the business side of football uh, has, you know, uh, I've got major knowledge about it, of course, not just because of playing football within the technical side point of view, but also the business side, how, how has that been run? So owning a football club is a kind of a, a natural flow of nature to go involved because you can see where you can maximize the, the revenue stream, where you can actually do some social aspects within the football industry, uh, but also uh, make sure there's sustainability behind that, you know. And in 2009, there was an opportunity there because already financed or helped to finance Portsmouth at the time, they're struggling at the time financially and I refinanced some of the assets they had so they can actually continue. And then I saw, okay, they wanted to sell and I saw there might be opportunity. Um, and the reason why it didn't go actually ahead, to be honest with you, is because it was the debt within the due diligence was way much too high uh, for such a small, small leash club, we call it, okay. Uh, we're talking nearly 100, over 120 million pounds. We're talking in 2009 up to that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that was quite a big mountain of debt to take over with as well. And and that pretty much put uh, me off as well to even go consider to buy this club, to be honest Okay. And, and, and any idea like uh, where does this such a huge debt come from? Like, like that it well, comes I to think, this I amount? That, yeah. You know, well, this is the, the problem is with, within the football industry, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, uh, not now with the COVID-19. COVID-19, frankly saying, put everything to, to the table now, transparency inside, how the football clubs really, really, really financially, I would say some part actually mismanaged, to be honest with you. So mm -hmm. some part of whatever income comes into it is already spent or more. Uh, and relying on potential future income, so like transfers or even refinance and TV rights, etc. And it's a normal business. You don't run like that, to be honest with you. You know, you need to have certain sustainability behind that. You need to have a basic kind of uh, uh, saving or well, kind of cash reserve into in case of something happen or the club is doesn't doesn't well. And the club philosophy of managing some of the businessmen or actually investing in football clubs, they don't actually see that when they're buying into the club. It's funny enough because it's, I meet a lot of investors who want to play in club. Their business, they're running it nicely and tight in terms of the budget and etc. But when they're going to the, the football industry where it's a completely different animal, they're getting overexcited and emotionally. And that's the problem. When you start to get emotionally, you're overspending it and you think yeah, it's gonna go, it's gonna come back. But one is not if it's not coming back, that's where the trouble is. And I think that's where needs to be learned now, this mm. time now with COVID-19, that you need to create a sustainable kind of uh, 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 financial uh, uh, program within the, the club that um, everybody uh, as such has a long-term future with this club because don't forget clubs is not just not a business anymore you know this is a really a social impact to the local uh, people to the fans of course and 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 i see that that today the emotional side and the soul of football is more and more being taken away unfortunately because I, because people who want to invest they see only the profit side 
And when you see only profit, there's no emotion in place. And football, it's a lot of emotion in place. And if you give it, that, if you take this away, the main soul of that game is going away. And I hope we can, or well, people can change around it to, to really bring that game back. Or really, uh, everybody fall in love, in myself as well, you know, to watch as a little kid, to admire the big players, uh, you know, as a, big, as a small kid, I was not talking about how much money I want to make money. I want to say I want to play against in the big stadium to see yeah. I'm coming from, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Talking today to the young kids, etc. cetera, I, oh, I want to have a car, I want to have a, this. And yes, everybody will, will like to have that, to be honest with you. But that's not uh, the aim to be a professional football player. And I think that is now, that's the side where I believe has been taken away the last 10, 15 years. Um, money needs always football uh, and, and, and there should be always put money into it you know because mm -hmm. it's really worthwhile to put within the football industry money that means from the top leagues all the way to the lower leagues because that really have a sh huge social impact within the countries each country because you take away a lot of criminality you're giving hope to players to kids to coaches and don't forget football employs so much not just the players but everything around football look look, look, look at us we're talking about football you're talking mm -hmm. about the show about football but yep. the football does not exist anymore what are you going to talk about it do you see where i'm coming from so mm -hmm. it's, it's it's very important that the, that soul of that game is kept uh, uh um um up you know and, and and not really in the front front run that whole business side i the money side i understand that because i'm myself a business on the financial side you know but mm -hmm. you can put something together it's sustainable but at the same time you don't give you don't take away the soul of that game so 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 it comes down to really striking a fine balance here like ramon because you know if if the owner is like a hardcore football fan and, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's where you say maybe lots of emotions come into place here and uh, you know yes. the, the, the spending gets out of control and, and stuff like that but but do you consider a football club as a, a an asset uh, but if not taken care of well it's going to be like a bleeding asset well no listen I, mm -hmm. if you asked me this question maybe 15 years ago mm -hmm. I would say some part yes it would be kind of, it's a hobby for a big investor to be part of the local, they call it business guys, because that's what it used to be. Don't forget, the local clubs used to be owned by most of the business guys, local business guys who had made some success within their own business. And they say, you know what, let's have our local team. We support them, we buy mm -hmm. it and run the it fan, as a yeah. Saturday afternoon like farm and go to watch etc mm -hmm. now as i repeat before that has moved now the last 10 15 years the business it's a business now it's mm -hmm. starting to get a business because now digitalization comes in place social media comes in place uh, everybody can watch from where we the world compared to 15 20 years it was limited let's call it okay if i think about back when asia 15 20 years ago it was limited to watch some of the european t uh, teams you know uh, in tv um you know or even 30 years now pretty much there are more supporters and followers in asia of the premier league to be honest because of the you know the tv rights and exposure to that league is uh, has extreme improved the last 10, 15. Well, that's actually good for the game, to be honest with you. So if I'm looking back in terms of you asking the questions, uh, yes, it's a very good business at the moment. Actually, now even better because this COVID-19 period has without a doubt devalued most of the assets within the football teams within Europe or other mm -hmm. places as well because of the crisis has took away a lot of the valuation of the club, but they still have some fantastic assets within, within the club to continue. So if I was the wiser for an investor as such, I would say yes, absolutely. It's a great uh, 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 move to invest into it, but it has to look into a long term and it has to have a good project in place. And I'll tell you what now, if you do it well, he really can do some very good returns within that club.
Mm-hmm. Okay. Great review on the financial side. Uh, but this has happened in 2015 when the uh, world uh, FIFA suspended their president and the vice president for, due to corruption allegation. Uh, is this, uh, I remember you telling to BBC Sports that you are deciding to run for the FIFA presidency. And mm-hmm. you quoted that I came without baggage and I have substantial experience from both football and finance. So would you like to try again this FIFA presidency in the uh, coming, coming future? Listen, um, at that time in 2015, uh, let's have a little bit back, you know, uh, we all know the, 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 the football governing body was in, on the ground, yeah. Yeah. Right, okay? Uh, for a lot of reasons, we all know now. We don't have to repeat that ourselves because I think it's yeah. like a, uh, everybody knows in the world what's going on within that organization, to be honest with you, okay? Now, um, at that time, there was so much uncertainty who was going to lead such an organization that it was nearly, nearly impossible to even find the potential suitable candidate to have... Uh, 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 to go into it because either he's afraid from the reputation point of view or he has, I'm assuming, some potential backage behind, etc., etc. Okay. And in my case, it was not that something I wake up in the morning at that time, do you know what? I want to be a FIFA president. It's, that's not the way it works, to be honest with you. You know, it was pretty much put forward to me at that time. Uh, because I was working already within the financial industry, I was talking to a lot of banks already and private equity funds, etc. But not limited. I was talking within the football industry bodies quite a lot already because I helped them potentially financing some of the the, uh, the, the need, etc. So by totally obviously default at the time uh, went through all the uh, system. system uh, know what is needed and so on the way up to the system. Uh, I've been on the top level as well, played in most of the European top leagues as well. And also post-career, uh, go into the boardroom or within this industry. That means the administrative side point of view within the clubs, with the federation, knowing what kind of uh, financial and potential governing issues were in there, of course. you know, Because as a football uh, man and, and been rising into it, you, you, you see it in a different way than actually a man who comes maybe from a legal background or potential accountant where it's institutionalized and he's, he's, he's pretty much used to have that institutionalized kind of environment. And football is not yet really institutionalized. And that's the kind of issue we have, you know, and the problem we had in the past as well because it was still kind of charity-wise slash managing as a government body over the football, make sure that uh, everything's in place, but not really institutionalize the whole structure, okay? And having these two hats, I one is the football side and having the financial side uh, in knowledge and experience, I thought I can actually give quite a lot and, and, and provide a lot of knowledge to that industry and the government body. Uh, so for that point of view, I say, yes, why not? Uh, it's something to go ahead and, 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 and try, you know. But, you know, it's obviously always political, the whole experience there. I had a great experience, to be honest with you. Uh, do, during this time, I met some uh, fantastic people within the administration and federations within that industry. Some are some great, some, of course, have to questioning. That's always like that. But from my point of view, if, uh, it was something, it has actually opened my eye even more now. Because at that time, I, yeah, I try, see how it goes. But now it has even opened more in my eyes that there is the possibility that this organization and actually the football industry needs certain changes in terms of attitude, in, in terms of not just the governing way of administrative way of point of view that's quite uh, not straightforward but something you can implement it but i think it's the message who you want to try to give within the football industry and i think that's the responsibility as as a fifa head of fifa that you giving a a certain standard 
within the industry where I think until now, uh, obviously it's been questioning quite a lot. And when you're questioning in an institution, then the credibility uh, comes off as well. And when the credibility comes off with you, then your business side of the doing with this institution will be even more difficult because always a question mark will come arise over you. So I think that's one of the major things, uh, important part where I believe uh, uh, without a doubt that could actually bring to you to the table. Mm-hmm. All right, all right. Interesting enough. Um, in your playing career, I mean, I'm definitely you've faced so many great strikers. I mean, you even mentioned a few names earlier during your seven months in Italy. I mean, who would you re- re- consider the most difficult one that you ever had to man mark in your career? Oh, wow. Um, I've been asked this question quite often, to be honest to you. <laughs> and I, I, should, I should have like a, you know, replay automatic, you know, but every time I, I've been asked this question, I have to stop for about 10, 20 seconds, to be honest, because I really had some great, great, great strikers to play against too, you know. I'm just talking the Argentine international Gabriel Batistuta. You all know him, I'm mm-hmm. assuming. Yeah, okay. yep, we do, we do. Uh, he's fantastic. Uh, uh, Robbie Baccio, you know him as well, Italian international. Oh, yes. Uh, of course, uh, not limited, of course, uh, like Alan Shearer in England. Uh, Teddy Sheringham, of course. Played with me, played against, of course, you know, both time, you know. Uh, obviously, the Brazilian Ronaldo, there's no doubt, mm. of course. Uh, so, I, I, you know, if I look at all of them, I think the Brazilian Ronaldo, between the Brazilian Ronaldo and Patistuta, is one of the ones the most difficult, really, really difficult opponent to play as a defender. Because mm-hmm. they, some of the strikers, when you analyze them in video clips and you as a defender, you do that before the games, you know. You know where the potential weaknesses are there, you know. If they're left footed, the right foot of these are stronger on the speed and the first five yards, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So you can anticipate some of the movements in the game, you know, because you memorize what he's doing with in his in the video clips you're watching, you know. Problem with these two two players, Ronaldo and Batistuta, <laughs> this is like you can watch a thousand hours of video clips on the game. Nothing's going to happen like that. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> because you really step out of uh, completely uh, way. You're thinking that's the way it's going to go. And he really, I said, Ronaldo in this case, trick you in a way that you actually, yeah, you're completely going a different way. And Patisuta is super, super 18 yards box. He's one of, from my point of view, one of the best 18 yards box kind of scorer. If you give him a, just one yard or even half a yard, uh, the 18 yards box or around the 18 yards box, you know it's going to be a school. And and for him, it, you know the intelligence, the movements, how he goes around the, uh, the defenders. I think this is one of the most difficult part I uh, pretty much uh, played against you. Know. And uh, you know, preparing yourself against uh, these kind of players. I mean, I mean, how, how is it something that you study each and every one of them all the time? As as in, um, let's say, well, when there is a match comes in. Well, I think in my days, you know, it was, you know, there was the VHS kind of video clips. There was no ZDs in those times, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or YouTube or whatever in those days, you know. And so you really, really, really have to find some video clips for these guys to study, to be honest with you. So kind of, uh, it was like 50% you can study by video clip and 50% ad hoc, to be honest with you, because you only been told by somebody who was scouting the games of these players or the manager or the assistant coach is telling you and that's the way to mark him, etc. So you pretty much at hoc somebody you have to have an intuitive instinct how to market. This is why I'm saying this world uh, the game in those days in the 90s, uh, if I look back all the games now, there were some fantastic games to, to watch because Yes, there was less data than they have now today in the modern game because today it's unbelievable. All the clubs have like huge data for each player against. They have a AI involved already. They got you know the technology has enormous influence within the football industry. Okay, you know, but in those days they didn't have that. 
So that kind of personal human instinct or on, on, on the field was way much more expected than the day, to be honest with you, okay? So from that point of view, I say the 90s was for me one of the best football I've ever played in, in, in Europe and the world as well, including the World Cups and European Championships. Okay, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe just before the 90 faced these two great strikers, uh, are you really able to sleep thinking about them? <laughs> well, luckily I didn't drink alcohol, otherwise, bloody hell, I would be... <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't drink alcohol at all, so from that point of view, uh, you know, um, I wasn't there. Uh, yes, you don't, you don't sleep anyway after a big game, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I never could sleep uh, after a game, uh, because you are, especially if you have an evening game, if you have an 8 o'clock kickoff game and you finish at 10 o'clock at night, there's no chance I could actually even sleep one minute uh, because once you finish your game uh, pretty much a one hour, two hours later, you're, you're lying in bed, obviously exhausted, but the whole game is like a movie goes through your mind. It pretty much every single action you go through, the action, some of the mistakes might you done or you could do better or the passes you potentially might should done in a, in a better way uh, or, or tackles, you know, you pretty much have the whole night your mind is completely not sleeping. And, um, and that's pretty much most, uh, most of the games I had, uh, I could never sleep. Nevertheless, if you play against the big players like these guys, because then, you know, if you had a nightmare game, you definitely don't sleep then. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Raymond, indeed, uh, fantastic memories during your playing days. And, uh, you know, actually, Bala is a huge fan of Batistuta. And, and you know, to, for you to say that he's one of the most difficult to mark, well, I'm sure Bala is very happy to say. <laughs> Bala, Bala, I got seen the shirt. I got seen the shirt. From Batistuta, <laughs> the uh, Maybe after the podcast. <laughs> he, he's fantastic. He is fantastic, I have to say. He was a fantastic he was a fantastic player. He was a, he's a fantastic human being as well. Uh, yeah, it's some great more memories, to be honest with you. And, and, and listen, we are on a different generation now. The football has changed a lot. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned in this uh, uh, conversation, yes, some part to the better. Let's say that. Let's be honest, of course. Uh, Chris Lau, listen to me. Listen to women football. I'm very happy that's really now uh, 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 is going the right direction. I've been for five years already talking to everybody. Listen, the women's football is going to be huge within the next five to ten years, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously a lot of uh, government body has to support that and, and, and the local uh, kind of government bodies as well, you know. Uh, so from that point of view, it has really improved uh, that industry. Uh, obviously more money has come into it, more data, more digital kind of uh, 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 improvement within the kind of the football industry. That's all good, but the problem I still have, uh, some of the soul of that game might vanish and I want and I'd like to, uh, to keep that soul uh, because that's the dream of every little kid's boy to be a player in football. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Ramon, just, uh, you know, as a player, when do you know it's time to call it quits, you know, and make the difficult decision to retire, you know? Can you share with us what are the thoughts that go through your mind as a professional player when the time comes? As a player, never. Because mm -hmm. as a player, you're like a little kid. That's what I'm trying to say, you know? This, mm -hmm. this dream as a little boy, going with a ball into the, to your, your local park maybe or your little garden you have in the background or on the street of your little community where you're playing where you know uh, and, and you every day after school you're actually missing school sometimes just because you're actually playing the game or finish the game that kind of emotion that kind of passion behind as a little kid that's where you dream to be uh, playing football after books you know and that's where and you will always keep that as a player and that means even you're at 30 plus years old, you're still in your mind like a kid, to be honest, because you're still actually exercising the dream you wanted to have as a little boy. And I was super, super 
fortunate and happy that uh, I could actually do such a profession, to be honest with you. I was very lucky. Uh, I, I was, thank God, every day that actually are really good to, to such, a, such a sport, such a beautiful sport, you know. As a little boy, I was dreaming, and then suddenly reality came in place. And to have that feeling, I wish to have a little kid who really dreams to do of playing football, to have that, because it's just very, very, very beautiful to have, you know, and keep that as much as you can, as long as you want. So the question, when is, when is really the time to go? Well, obviously never, because you wish to be a kid all day long, you know, and want mm -hmm. to play football. But the body, yeah, the body, not anymore the same like the mind. And that's the problem we have, of course. Once it comes to a 30 plus, mm -hmm. uh, your body is obviously not as fit as it used to be, but your mind is still very experienced and very sharp, but your body's not there. So that's the hardest part of any football player. It's that, that's it, it's finished. The dream, in a way, is gone. You have to go to a different direction now. You need to look into the future now. Uh, and, and, and that's a super, super, super so hard uh, decision for any player in the world. Any sports personality, any professional, I would say, because we do live a nice little bubble for a long time. And, and it's, you're enjoying that bubble and suddenly that's gone. It's finished, you know, and you really have to go to basics like every single person in the world. Uh, I get a normal job or if you're lucky and you earn some money, you can do potentially some business or you go back into the coaching and so on. But not everybody has the, the fortune or the opportunity to do that. And this is kind of... One of the parts I'm also advocating a little bit as well is this kind of post-career of players and sports uh, people, you know, because that's not looked into either. Everybody looks to the legend, the star. But what, what, what happened when they finish? Not all of them have opportunity to be educated from home because the background are coming from extremely humble backgrounds and they were lucky to play football to get out of that and feed the family and get them a different life and that's the beauty about football as well as a social aspect but when it's finished these people need help to go into a different direction they have some great attributes because they were disciplined sports people uh, they were uh, and they can use them in many uh, functionality within the business world as well to be honest with you they're good ambassadors as well and but it's not happening too much and I can see, and there's a lot of colleagues I have or friends, um, they get lost afterwards. And the problem is, if they get lost, they go into a very dark place. That means either they get divorced or they get alcohol or potentially drugs, where, you know, the depression comes in place. And that part, it's very, very difficult for any any player has to stop. Uh, it's it's We need to mention that because everybody glorified to play, play uh, football and be a star but I think the post career as a as a thing it's it's not a nice place to be for everybody you know uh, so in my case I was very fortunate because I was educated in Switzerland but at the same time was also driven to go into in a business world and do something afterwards I will I will say to any player who's still playing now today if they can educate some part or anything you know it doesn't have to be a major PhD, we call it in this case, you know, but something where they actually can actually step down once they finish the career, that will help them enormously to make a decision when they finish the career. And they also have options. And I think this is very important uh, for any football player who has a, a career and wants to go uh, after, after playing football. Don't forget, we're still only 34, 35 years old, very young. Mm -hmm. True, true. And, and of course, it's very important for footballers to actually plan their post-playing career because, as you mentioned, not everyone gets into coaching or becomes, you know, media personnel like Pandit or Analysis. So, you know, like just like yourself, you actually had a plan. I don't know whether is it was it a plan that you had that venturing into real estate business. Uh, but <coughs> do you think that every player should have some ideas of what they should do once they retire? I think so, yes. You know, listen to me. I think today, uh, the good thing about uh, the social media and this communication 
and we have and today i think the world is getting much closer and uh, together you know compared in my times it was distance you know communication is non-existing and help for players was even less existing in those days you know you were just lost lost soul okay you played and you have your contract and that's it but when you finish nobody really cared what are you actually doing and where you're going or you have to take care of your future such in my time you know so um it's more and more the last 10 15 years they are starting to realize even clubs but in my in, in my opinion federations and associations that should do much more on this because they can really use these 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 personalities or players within their organization because they're bringing broad of experience from very young age within these organizations and this association or federations or club that should have like a sideline for post-career kind of management scenario for people or players already playing with them or as a young thing, so they're already prepared, or at least give them the option, open their eyes to them. Listen, guys, playing football, you're 20 today, but you know what? Within 10 years' time, it's finished. It's only 10 years. And you still have to obviously work up to 60 plus potentially, you know? So make sure within these 10 years, you either do an education or planning where you want to go after that. And I think this is very important, that social aspect, that the club's welfare and the football association really working together to do that, because that's super important, because the players are important for the federations and clubs as well. So they should also look after them, not just because of the contract and paying them, but also the welfare post-career. Okay, okay. And uh, of course, you know, you mentioned about the soul of the game being taken away. I would presume that, in your opinion, VAR is one of the aspects of it. Can you repeat the question again, please? Okay. Uh, you were mentioning earlier, you know, that you know, the, uh, part of the soul of the game is now being taken away. Would you consider VAR as part of it as well? Um, is, I would say the VAR, to be honest to you, uh, that money is being invested in too, could be used much better. Mm-hmm. in the game okay um, VAR supposed to improve the game isn't it technically yes yes is new I can accept that mm. but between, between you and me I don't think so it has any particular enormous improvement to the game mm-hmm. the game itself has way much bigger issue to improve than have a VAR and, and this point of view in the game. I don't think that's looking too quite wisely because VAR is not played in the lower leagues. It's only for professional. Mm-hmm. What about the people in the amateur clubs? How, or even the lower leagues? How, what do they do? Is that only just for the elite, the VR mm-hmm. of the game? Or is it for the, the whole development of the game? I see. So that's the question you need to ask more. And in my opinion, it doesn't look like it's for the overall development of the game. Because football doesn't start only just in the top league, in the World Cups, in the European Championship, etc. Football starts in the park. And then you have rule of regulations, you've been implemented, and from that 11 11, you play. And within that game, that's where you have to improve within the structure of this 11 again. But technical side point of view, in the lower league and the overall development, I don't think so. It has enormous impact to the game. And that's what has to be looked into more carefully. And, and, and from my point of view, I don't think so VR has that impact. And again, that money spent because for the association and federation, it's a big cost for the leagues to set up such a VAR because you, you need three referees in the room. Uh, you've got the technical side of, of the uh, technology. You have to buy into it. That's a lot of money. 
-hmm. Just that uh, money could potentially uh, develop the women's football or the youth development or coaches can be more teached or coached technically to teach more kids because that's where's luck into it. You know, to have more ambassadors as a coach and be quality coaches in, in, on the ground. This is where you have to put the money into it more and more. Because then the game and the, and the top will be much better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting point, sir. Mm -hmm. um, are, you, are you agree with me or are you uh, disagree? With <laughs> well, uh, I have to say I agree with you. I, I mean, um, I'm not totally against VAR because I think uh, it, help, it does have improved some of the decision making, although I still think there, there is room for improvement. But as you mentioned, you know, if for... For a lot of the uh, lower, or should I say, lower rank nations, the you know the associations, you know, like in Asia, Africa, and all that, they may not have the sufficient uh, resources in order to invest in something like VAR. So, perhaps, you know, maybe on a on a top level, maybe like FIFA and all that, they might need to look into how VAR can be best used across, rather than just at major tournaments or major leagues. Uh, would you agree with that? Well, yeah, it could be done that, of course. You, you just mentioned a, a very good point here, you know, African nations or, or, the, or, or Asian uh, Federation Association, you know, they are uh, in a completely develop development cycle, of course, you know. Any money comes into that association, it's really to improve the uh, infrastructure. Uh, because one of the major issues within these countries is the infrastructure, okay? Well, even having a, a decent football pitch or, or goals is not existing. Why should we expend an extra more money on a technology which actually really only serves at the top league? In the smaller leagues within the Asian Federation or, or, or federations, where really any, any penny counts, to be honest you, there should be more counted to have, you know what? You need to have really some quality coaches, some good development coaches, technically, because then if a small nation, I look at as a Swiss, Swiss is a small, small nation compared, and that's the similar certain countries in Asia and all of that, and the federation are very small. But if your strength is coming for very quality infrastructure slash coaching, you will attract, without a doubt, more and more some quality players. And what's happening, the follow-up of quality players, the national team more and more start to be better. The knowledge of the, of the players getting higher, and then suddenly the international level, they're getting better as well. So suddenly the qualification potential World Cup will be much more feasible, let's call it, okay? But if you if if only looking in the over top side, then you're never gonna reach to that side. So he, he needs, really, really, really do have that in coaching grassroots improvement that even small association has an opportunity to shine, even they don't qualify for World Cups as such, but shine at least by producing potentially quality players and go to top leagues because they've got some fantastic facilities and they have some quality coaches on the ground. Mm -hmm. That's what I see should be development of football going into it and money. Mm -hmm. Interesting point there. Okay, guys, uh, any last questions from yourself? Yeah, uh, I got one for Ramon. Uh, you know, you, you have played in some interesting derbies in your playing career. You know, uh, let, let's take, for example, the old firm derby and the North London derby. So, which one really stood out for you among these two derbies? Huh. Both are massive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Spurs, Tottenham Hotspurs, Arsenal is huge, you know, yeah, uh, North definitely. London derby. But I have to say, Celtic Rangers yep. is enormous. It's a whole new it's level. Uh. In a different level. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 60,000 people watching, and you're coming out of that tunnel at Celtic Park. I, I tell you what, you, you think 200,000 people watching you. The noise <laughs> is so loud. Um, and I don't know if you ever saw one of the games of Celtic. You know, Celtic, the famous thing before you start, the team gets in a huddle, you know, like Repke, you know, together, you know? Mm -hmm. And the captain has to talk, 
and obviously motivate the players. We're going to win today, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when it goes to that level, that the captain says, "Listen, we need to go into the huddle, okay, together." All right? You can hear at Celtic Park the whole fans, all voices going down, like they want to listen to to the captain what he's saying. <laughs> We're talking sixty thousand, eh? Nearly yeah. sixty thousand people. Going from very loud and suddenly silent. And the minute we come out of that huddle and we kind of really ex uh, excited about it, that moment of screaming of the fans is off the clock. It's absolutely unbelievable. It's goosebumps for the player, even for, for somebody who's watching it live, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So that experience as a derby, can you imagine double of that? Because it's such a huge rivalry, Rangers Celtic. It's huge in Glasgow. Yeah. It's unbelievable. One week beforehand, they're talking every day. We had about 2,000 people watching at the training ground, just only. Mm -hmm. mm. And they came from all around the world, from the US, from everywhere to Glasgow, just to watch that derby. So there's no doubt, Rangers, uh, Celtic Rangers is one of the biggest derby in the mm. world. Interesting. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you for your time, Raymond. And uh, my question basically is: among all the leagues you have played in Syria, in uh, English Premier League, and also even like you mentioned about Scottish League, where who you think the most passionate fans or or maybe uh, very engaged to the to the sports and maybe they are more very passionate about the game? Passionate about the fans as such. In which league are you talking about? Yeah. Okay. It can be Syria. It can be. Uh, who, who you well, think? listen. I think no doubt England and, 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 and in Scotland, the passion is very high. The, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's fantastic to play in England in a stadium and in, and in, in Scotland. There's no doubt that, you know, the passion, the people behind is, it's unbelievable. Uh, that's absolutely no doubt. I think from my point of view, England and Rangers, I, or I Scotland in this case, you know, uh, is the two leagues where I would say the passion is huge, enormous, the fans are unbelievable you know passionately about football not saying italian fans are not uh, passionate at all they're extremely passionate you know <laughs> they have you know this mediterranean kind of uh background they have you know so don't forget you know my name is ramon vega it's a spanish name so i got spanish background as well you know so God, okay. <laughs> i know what the kind of you know these guys the passion and emotion comes behind you know and uh, and i will say in asia you guys have very similar passion about it. Very similar about, about the game, you know? When I, when I went over there to see some of them, you know? And the Italians at the Serie A, of course, they, they are in a different way, the passion, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say England and Scotland, if without a doubt, uh, the most passionate and emotional kind of uh, uh, fans in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, interesting. So, any last word from yourself, uh, Ramon, before we wrap up this episode? Uh, no, I just, I think, uh, yeah, well, the first question, how, how do you see the Asian football is actually developing, especially in Malaysia? How is Malaysia, how do you see Malaysia really uh, is developed on the football side? Uh, well, it's, uh, there are some good uh, positive signs uh, in terms of you know the exposure the league gets these days, uh, in terms of the, six. I mean, in terms of the success that we have been having, on not just in Southeast Asia but also on the Asia Asia level. You know, yes. as, as I'm sure if you follow, you know, the Malaysian national team during the last World Cup qualifier, you Absolutely, know, there's been yeah. a lot. There's Absolutely. been a lot of positive results, and yes. I'm I, I don't know whether did you saw this or anybody showed to you a, a clip of Malaysian fans who were you know demonstrating you know their passion of in the stands similarly as what if we have seen in Dortmund mm -hmm. yeah, I mean you can check out a YouTube clip on that so yeah there's a lot of good signs on the game I mean it's heading in the right direction not as fast as we would like to but you know there are slow baby steps being taken and of mm -hmm. course you know we have a football club by Joe Daro Takzim JDT which has yeah. also been progressing very well in Asia you know they've been getting a lot of good results and these are the good signs that are on Malaysian football, whereby I can say, you know, there, there is a rainbow at the end of the rain. And we, we, we are just, um, how do we say, optimistic about mm -hmm. where the future leads for us. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's good to hear. It's good to hear that you you're actually talking positive about the Malaysian football as such. You know, I I monitoring that side as well, not just Malaysia but the whole Asian slash Southeast Asia, of course. You know, um, from my experience of being in these countries and seeing as such on the ground uh, some of the basic stuff from football. You know, where you know. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think Malaysia has improved. Uh, in, 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 I would say the last four or five years, to be honest with you, or, the, or more, you know. But it could actually improve way much more, to be honest with you, from my opinion, uh, in certain parts of the, of, of the football area of the grassroots of Malaysia, uh, in other part of South Asia as well. And I think Asia, in my point of view, he has a good opportunity now to grow enormously within the next five to ten years uh, because they have the attribute behind, they have the passion of the fans and there's no doubt there's some good youth development uh, at grassroots, I fans we call it, but I don't see yet when I come back in terms of the technical side, grassroots and coaching, that side has to be improved enormously within the area. If they're doing that side, I think that uh, the football side in the, in the first team, I, I, the national team, will improve massively, huge, within the next five to ten years. Mm-hmm. I mean, interesting points there. And, and of course, you know, since you mentioned earlier that you actually do a lot of uh, you know, business dealings with uh, football association and federation in this part of the world, what mm-hmm. are the challenges that you face? I mean, as you know, many of these associations are... You know, the top position is held by royalty, so local mm-hmm. politicians. You know, they're mm-hmm. not necessarily footballing people. Uh, so mm-hmm. what, what is the challenge there for you? Well, I have to answer this quite democratic about it. Um, <laughs> <politically>. <laughs> um, yes, you, you got a point there. This is... Um, um, I think, I think the, 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 the point where the challenge is here because football is actually a global sport okay and has one unique language that's the beauty about it okay everybody understands football does you don't have to be a particular no english french spanish or whatever language or local language you can actually play with anybody on the field without talking to him because that's football. That's the beauty about it, okay? All right. What is very important for some of these association federations we have or having or on board of, of them where because obviously they're linked with the country's political uh, part of it, you know, they need to understand that the Football Federation has a certain responsibility to the country as well. It's one of the ambassadors, is one of the arms of social impact to the country, okay? So it's important that the development side has to be carefully studied properly, you know, because that will benefit the so-called royals or part of their names and reputation. They're actually really doing something for the country, you know. And this is one of the challenges uh, as such you need to look into it because I look always, you need to understand the culture of each, in, each individual country. You can't just go into a country and say, this is the way we're doing it over there, let's say in Europe or anywhere. That's impossible. And that will be a blind, stupid person to come in and tell somebody in South Asia or Asia to tell them how it works. First thing you need to understand their culture and attitude towards that sport. Once you understand that side, you can actually design the program around that. Because then they will understand what you're trying to achieve within that country. And again, within each Asian country has an alter, a different culture as well. So you, you have to really study first their culture. And then once you understand that, then you can actually also talk in the same level with these so-called, as you say, maybe the royalty or some politicians coming in place, understand where and where they're coming from, why they want to have such a position. And once you understand that side, then you can actually communicate with these people in a very high level 
with a very progressing program you can implement in these countries. And that's where I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's the challenge to do it, you know? If once you understand that, and mutual understanding with the country you're actually talking to, then you have a progress to do it, you know? And I, 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 I look at always from that side. I'm not just coming into any country and say, listen, this is the way it's gonna happen. This is the way you have to do it. Because that's really uh, not the way to talk and respect to these single countries in Asia and all of that. First of all, you have to respect them, their culture, their attitude towards that sports as football. And once you understand that, then you know you can actually put the program around that attitude and culture. And that will help enormous within Asia countries, enormous. Mm, okay, well, that's, that's a wonderful point that you shared with us. Um, okay, um, uh, any, any more last words from yourself? No, I think uh, I'm really happy that uh, I can talk to Malaysia and the, the region. Is it only just in Malaysia you, you're displaying it? Or, uh, uh? Oh, no, we're, oh. we're playing throughout the whole world, basically. <laughs> yeah, so anyone oh, can God. listen to us, Ramon, and we are, we are so happy <laughs> and me. really... Yeah. You're the Asian Bola BBC, isn't it? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But listen, guys, it is really, really, really a pleasure to talk to you guys, okay? And yeah. uh, I wish you all the best. Most important, keep healthy, you know, to everybody. And I uh, hope you all, you know, pass this uh, COVID-19 uh, yeah, scenario well and we're coming out uh, all uh, in the terms of uh, a good way and uh, new as well you know mm-hmm. thank you so much Raymond, for for joining us on this show today yeah we appreciate thank you so it yeah. thank you so much thank you Mar. say hello to malaysia and everybody sure we will do we will do <laughs> so with that said everyone uh, we would like to end this week's uh, this episode of the bola bola show podcast thank you everyone stay safe and goodbye Vega has put Tottenham ahead from Sheringham's cross. Ramon Vega scores his first goal for Tottenham.